My name is Dr. Joyce Bluford. Um, most kids call me Dr. Joyce. I'm a geologist here at the Math Science Nucleus, but right now I'm at the Children's Natural History Museum where when we talk about these fossils, these are the fossils that um, you can, when we reopen up probably in the fall, you guys will be able to come in here. We got a whole lot of new fossils um, from Facebook. Facebook was just uh, building a new place in Menlo Park and they found fossils and we'll be putting them on display. And, so, and we're also opening up um, our minerals. We're expanding that and we're gonna have a fluorescent mineral area. So you'll be able to see minerals that um, kind of glow in the dark. So we'll be having a lot of changes here in the, at the nucleus, hopefully making it a little bit better for you guys. Um, most of our, if you don't know what the Math Science Nucleus does, um, we also run Tule Ponds at Tyson's Lagoon. We will be having um, it open in mid-June and people will be able to do some activities there. Um, mostly you'll have to register. Most of that stuff will be online once we get going. Hopefully too in the fall, we're gonna reopen the California Nursery Historical Park. We have a museum there, we fixed it all up and we'll be doing events there, but they're fixing the whole park up. So come fall, hopefully we'll just expand and provide some services for you guys to get some hands-on look at um, what we're doing. So, um, so today's, uh, and I'll be repeating this as people start coming in, we start, um, we have a whole bunch of people coming in. Um, we'll be looking at climate change and the fossil evidence. Um, we're, <clears throat> our group is also working at a new center that will be available for people. This will be in Sonol. It's going to be called the Alameda Creek Watershed Center. And there they found a big archaeological dig site there where they found the Mawakma Ohlone's, a big area where they found um, a lot of uh, fossil evidence of their inhabitation of the area. Um, so we'll be opening that up also, probably not in the fall, but probably in the spring of 22, where people will do field trips and on weekends, people will be able to get to see this, this great new um, museum. It'll be about 10,000 square feet. It will have um, information about the watershed. So it is a, that'll be a great new one. But we're looking over in that area around now um, because the Mawakma Ohlone were in this area for over 5,000 years. And there's evidence within the um, archaeological dig site of a climate abnormality, which means that there seemed to have been a big long period of drought that affected the site. And so we'll be talking about that. We'll we're actually going to have field trips that will uh, bring that out. So um, again, as more people are coming in, my name is uh, Dr. Joyce Bluford. I'm here at the Children's Natural History Museum, and we are going to look at climate change and fossil evidence. We're also going to look at what's kind of going around. You guys hear that term all the time, but what in the world does it mean? A lot of people, use it as a buzzword, but what does it really mean? And how is that evidence, um, <clears throat> how do we know how to interpret this evidence? Because um, right now we are going into a really bad drought. Um, it might be the worst in recorded history. We're at number three right now, um, which means that um, lack of water um, will impede our area because without water, humans and life as we know it cannot exist. So it does make a, um, a change in the areas. Uh, we might even talk about, if you think about uh, past civilizations like the Egyptians and the Aztecs and the uh, Mayans, a lot of them were flourishing. And then something happened to some of these civilizations that caused a major, major climate fluctuation that, that they had to leave their area because no matter how big your buildings are, no matter how high your technology might be, without water and a water source, um, civilization 
cannot exist. Um, we got to remember humans are part of that food chain. And without water, we don't exist either. We can move it around, but sometimes there's problems. Just like um, we won't talk too much about this today, but we get a lot of our water from um, uh, the snowpack. And now the snowpack is far away in the Sierras. So how in the world do we get it? And if what happens if something happens to the snowpack, is it going to affect us? And we, will, we do realize that will affect us. So we have it's a, we have about four minutes to go. And again, um, my name is uh, Dr. Joyce Blueford. Most kids call me Dr. Joyce. We will have 10 minutes at the end. So at uh, 1050, the, uh, the presentation will kind of end and we will then, uh, at, so people can ask questions. But we also will be around, we're available through um, email. You can email us questions and get them answered that way. Because this is a very, very difficult subject to actually understand because there's so many scientific facts from physical to geologic to physics, meteorology, all these things play a part. Even biology, um, the lack of trees, what does that do with our um, different parameters that uh, can affect um, the human race and all other races. So um, hopefully you guys have a good science background um, and you, you will be able to kind of understand this. We'll also talk about different fossils and I'll be showing you different ones that we find from this area, uh, Fremont is noted for its Irvingtonian fossils. We're gonna go into that because the main reason why most of these big Pleistocene mammals from our mammoths to mastodonts to saber-tooth uh, cats, why they went extinct was climatic change over time caused by probably plate tectonics. So humans weren't around there, um, but there is other factors than just human, human on, on climate change as hopefully we will understand in a little bit. Um, so we got two minutes to go and we're just about to start on our little journey to uh, climate change and the evidence that brings us to this. Um, just so you know, in the, um, I'm a researcher. Um, I mean, I'm retired now, but one of my early papers was looking at, um, I'm a micropaleontologist, so I study little bitty organisms. And they have told us, even back in the 70s and 80s, that there has been changes in their evolution through time. And that actually gives us, uh, we didn't quite know back then what that was all about, but we now know it has to do with fluctuations of climate change, usually due to large plate tectonic movements. So as we continue, we have one minute to go and we will be talking about climate change and fossil evidence. So um, again, it is now 1030, so we will start. Um, my name is Dr. Joyce Bluford. I'm a geologist who has studied in many, many parts of the world. Because in order to understand even climate change, you have to know what's going on, not just in our local area, but in other areas in the world. We have to understand where our flow of water comes and where our weather is evolving from. Now, remember weather, over long term gives us climate. That's a, a point, just so you know the difference. Weather is what's happening today, but if you start looking at historical times, and you have to remember, humans have only been getting historical records for maybe 150, 200 years at the most. Now, that's not in, in scientific terms, that's kind of a short time to really figure these climate change. So we have to rely on rocks and fossils to tell the long-term story and to maybe understand it a little bit more. So we are now at the Children's Natural History Museum and let's take a look at is our environment changing? Because guys, you only know what's happening today. 
when you want to go back through time, you have to get, collect a data set and try to put it in a context. But in geology, you have a, a famous statement that says the present is key to the past. And that's also true with climate change. We have to look at what's going on today and then go back through time and see what the effect is. Is it human? Some of it today is definitely human, but a lot of it is tectonics and our changing um, water flow. So, is our uh, so this is the kind of data we're collecting. If you look at this map, this is just short-term data. If you notice, this is just in a day. If you notice in the lower left-hand corner, it goes through the kind of the minutes. And so things change all the time. Now, this is looking at um, carbon. Um, uh, uh, dioxide in, in the, the, the area. And you'll notice that it does change all the time. Now, why would it change? Why would our earth change today? Well, it has to do with um, the cloud cover, the pressure zones, how things move around. But the baseline is our water cycle. Because when you have melting water or melting ice, then you have different densities. So let's kind of look at this. So I just want you to see that in this picture, we do have data to say something's going on. And is there things that trigger? Well, we know for sure that if big volcanic action, that can cause um, a, a depression in our uh, temperature and can actually um, or increase our temperature, which starts things uh, kind of flowing differently. So let's look at the CO2, which is carbon dioxide. Remember, we breathe in air. Air is mainly nitrogen. If you look in that upper uh, right-hand corner, uh, the bulk of what's in our atmosphere is nitrogen. Also notice the blue is our oxygen. Now humans and most mammals, most uh, uh, vertebrates need the uh, oxygen in order to survive. Now our atmosphere, has it always looked like that? Has there always been this kind of ratio from each other? Well, no, not at all. Um, in first, uh, in, in, in early times, there was more, there wasn't a lot of nitrogen. There was hardly any oxygen. Humans kind of, or vertebrates and uh, animals that need oxygen evolved as our atmosphere evolved. So we had to change our atmosphere. We mainly had a lot of methane when the earth formed over 4 billion years ago. Now let's look at that diagram right there. This is how we're collecting data. This is data from uh, one of the Hawaiian observatories and there's observatories all around the world that track these. Now, why is it all moving around like that? Why do we have, we call those like convection currents and it has to do with moving. If you ever look at um, the weather channel, channel, it talks about high pressure, low pressure and things are interacting in our atmosphere we think of the air as nothing, but it is moving. We can't see it. But when you start putting, uh, tracking it through um, chemical means, you can see this uh, changes. Now, if you look at it down, where is most of the activity uh, occurring right now? Um, or when this was taken. This is kind of in the, we have an increase of carbon dioxide in some of the Northern hemispheres. Now, if you notice, see where South America is, you can almost see where the Amazon rainforest is because what does, what does trees do for us? They take in carbon dioxide, they're a carbon sink. So we have evolved with trees and other plants. They give off what? Oxygen. What do we need? We need oxygen. What do we give off as we exhale? We're exhaling carbon dioxide. Who needs them? That is, who needs that um, compound? That would be our trees. And so there's this mutual relationship. If you look through the fossil record of trees and animals that need oxygen, it is a very wonderful relationship. So let's take a look at our Arctic cover. And this is looking at times from 1980, most of you, well, none of you were born then, to 2001. Look at, we have lost 35% of our Arctic 
ice covering. Well, what does that matter? That just means warm water. Well, it means that our whole system starts changing because what happens is melted water heavy or light, it's on the ocean. Now the ocean, remember, is what's in the ocean water. There's salt in it. Um, we have um, about 32% is, um, uh, is dissolved salts. So does that make it heavier than fresh water? So we have fresh water and we have salt water. So when this interactions occur in the Arctic, basically it produces very dense water. And then basically it sinks into the system um, and, and creates this flow within our oceans. You have to remember on the surface of our ocean, if you look at um, our globe here, the blue is our oceans. Our, our surface is mainly oceans, and it is a dynamic system, very much like our, um, like our atmosphere. It, it moves around depending on, the, um, uh, depending on the densities and how things are moving around. Also, what is our Earth doing? It is rotating. That causes movement of the liquid to create what we call the Coriolis effect. And that moves these big things of water, these different temperatures and different densities, and it can create different atmospheric um, pressure as we'll understand. So where does this water go when it melts? Um, well, it, like I said, it goes in on the surface of the water, but it also goes deep down. Now, look at this model here. This is predicted temperature changes. Now, how do we know this? Notice it's going all the way to um, uh, let's see, where is it stop? It goes to the 60s, I think, 70s, 80s. Okay, so this is going and trying to project. Why do you want to project this? Because there's something in the oceans, and this was something in the 70s. Um, this is what I did some research on, on El Nino and, El, and La Nina. These are, uh, it's called the child because it usually occurs around Christmas time. In, uh, in South America, all of a sudden water gets warmer or cooler. There's these changes. We noticed it by uh, fishermen would get find sardines and then, and then in other masses of years, and it, it's in this uh, like in 10 year cycles um, that you have an El Nino or a La Nina. Once we understood what was going on, we can then start tracking it and going back through time. We didn't know where it originated. Then we started to look, we started to have lots of sensors out there and we started to realize that our Pacific Ocean is vast, right? And notice as this thing is turning around, um, as you're seeing, you see North America, South America, that's land and land. Once you get into the Pacific Ocean, the North Pacific is ocean, the bottom is also ocean. So you have ocean, ocean. But then when you get into the Indian area, the Indian Ocean is water. And then if you go above it, you have China, you have India, uh, you have your Asia in there, you have water and you have land. That creates a problem because if you know, um, if you remember, let's go back in science here. If you heat up water, does the water and the, or the land heat up faster? The land heats up faster and the water lags. Okay, then that causes turbulence in the air and also in the water can, can creates these convection currents. And we realize that the El Nina and La Nina, Nina was caused, although we've seen it in history, was caused from the interaction of the Indian Ocean and the, um, the land above it. So our weather pattern starts there and goes around. That's why we, that's how meteorologists can predict weather. We can start looking at temperature. Um, there's a lot of physics in this and a lot of math that you, you put them in supercomputers and you come up with these modeling. And that's how we're predicting that the temperature changes will increase. And as you get an increase, it will start creating havoc in our oceans. So let's take a look at that. Now, 
This is our global temperature changes. Has it increased faster? Yes, it has. Um, but we, we realize that uh, humans probably do impact us, um, but there's other factors also like plate tectonics and, and, and other things that occur. But so what does this mean? So look at this um, picture here from 1950 to 2013, there is an increase of temperature where more in the north, not as much in the south. Um, now, is that because it started to generate um, heat and it started to increase just like the, the glaciers up there are, um, are calving off and create and, and melting quicker in the north than in the the southern, but are there other areas where there might be cold? Now you also have to remember that it was it was just in the Pleistocene when these big mammals used to roam this area that the weather was had more ice sheets, and we had ice that came all the way down to Long Island, um, over in the northern part, almost the Canadian border area. Um, so what caused that ice age? But before the ice age, it was warmer. And before that, there's so ice ages have or ice sheets have changed during time. That has to do with the plates moving around, causing um, uh, all these highs and lows in the atmospheres just change quite a bit. So we do realize that humans are a cause, but they're not the only cause. It is a natural system as our Earth evolves through time. Now, let's take a look at what's happening underneath our oceans. Now, if you look at that picture on the top where kind of where you have the ribbon, notice in the upper left-hand corner, it says start. Now that deep blue is bottom currents. It takes water when it melts, from the Arctic in the Greenland area, that's where our water, our bottom water start. It takes up to a thousand years to circulate throughout the earth. So it's on the bottom, but then notice in the Pacific Ocean, it starts coming up. Now, this is just a general. There's lots of eddies and oceanographers who study these phenomena take a long time to model all this. So this is just the basic way in which the water moves from the bottom up to the top, and then it has the surface. But you see where the dark blue changes into the light blue. This is something, a phenomena called upwelling. This is where this colder water, because remember cold water, is it lighter or denser than other water? It's denser because it's cold. The molecules are closer together. Um, now, but when it freezes, that's water's kind of weird because when it freezes, it gets air pockets and it floats. But cold water that's still liquid is denser. And then it, it gets this high saline from the North Atlantic. It drops down, then comes up through this upwelling. And that upwelling brings up these nutrients that is been at the bottom. And that causes a lot of biological life. So when we were talking about the anchos, anchovies and, and movement of um, the waters, that is all caused by this turbulence of water moving around. Now there's lots of different layers in our earth. As you can see in that bottom picture, um, down there, you can see that there's different layers, those little arrows, there's different layers of movement of water, depending on the density, um, how cold or how hot it is. So let's continue. Now, so does that this infect the ocean? Yes, we don't see it because we don't see, we don't have water eyes that we can see down. But there is massive changes occurring in our ocean because of these um, changes in our bottom currents, bringing warm water. Say you have a lush area like um, these coral reefs. Now coral reefs need uh, warmer water because they needs to be cal taking calcium carbonate out of the water. Like I said, this is kind of involved. If you like to really understand this, you have to appreciate and understand parts of the science and try to put every pieces together. So if the area gets too cold, 
that will kill off some of our corals. If it gets too murky, if we have too much sediment in the water, that will also kill a lot of our coral. And then the other organisms that they support will also die off. So biologists, geologists, physics, uh, all have to work together. Okay, now if an old tree could talk, you have to remember the oldest organisms are happen to be trees. If they could tell us what's going on in their tree rings, they can help tell a story. And these tree rings do help. Now there's ways of not cutting a tree down where you can take cores of a tree that will not kill it, where we can look at these um, concentric um, tree rings to look at the growth rate. And that helps us to measure different drought cycles, um, different wet seasons. Um, so there's all these things and also how much carbon is in the air. So these old trees tell us a story through their chemical imprint. It's kind of cool to see that. And there are people, scientists that just study these tree rings. Now, these, what happens if you deplete our forest? Well, we do have a problem. This can cause environmental changes. As you probably have heard, we're having with these droughts, it affects the trees. Trees also need water. Now, if they're taking water, if humans take out so much water and there's not enough for the trees, the trees will die. If the trees die, the relationship that I mentioned before will not be there. And so trees help us survive. That's why one of the reasons our group is involved in reforestation of the East Bay Hills. Um, we have lots of teenagers that help us grow trees and put them back in the forest. Because if you can read you can't remember a time, but 500 years ago, when the Mawakma Ohlone walked around here, we had way more trees than we have now. And so we need to help. Now look at the picture to the right, and you'll notice that the tree mortality, which means that it's living and dying, is very high. We are now gotten it not only from forests, but also from lack of water. And, and this causes a, this will cause a major problem in our atmosphere with the carbon, not getting enough carbon out of the cycle. So let's look at the evidence that tells us what um, is these, these changes, what has changed through time. So rocks tell us a story. Now, this is just a picture of looking when life came on this planet about a billion years ago. We didn't have the big animals that we had because land could not support and we did not have land animals. So if you look at the species that have evolved through time, it tells us a story, a fascinating story of how Climate changed because of moving continents, increased water, because um, we did not have water four billion years ago. It had to evolve through time, through our water cycle. Um, and then it keeps um, uh, mainly through outgassing from volcanoes, then that we've kept it on our atmosphere. None of it, we have an atmosphere that keeps that water vapor within our um, grep. We needed that in order to grow trees and then these animals need to eat. So, um, so let's take a look at a little bit more. How does the fossil, how does that record occur to us? And how do people like myself get that information and tell a story? Now, you have to remember, not all stories are that so obvious. Now, this is showing um, an animal dies. So you have a fish living, dies, goes to the bottom, and then it loses its uh, fossil, its bones. But notice that the snail, the original snail would have been a, a slimy looking creature. And if you look at it, what has occupied that shell after the, sh the snail died, you had a hermit crab in there. So sometimes we don't understand the whole story. That's why we have to, we have to look at 
at biologists and people environmentalists to see what's going on today so we could interpret the past. You also got to remember that these animals get eaten and they get re-eaten and moved around. And so the story is sometimes difficult. Okay, now let's take a look at, you guys are familiar with well, chalk, well, maybe some of you aren't, you're used to more of the whiteboard now, but early teachers used to use chalk, which was nothing more than a, um, a lot of little organisms. Now, these are little guys I studied. Um, these are called radiolarians. You pluck your eyelash and look at the diameter. They're no bigger than that. If you go in the ocean and swallow um, a gulp of water, you're eating about 10 of these little guys. They're all over the place. And they eat little bitty one cell plant called diatoms. So this is like the beginning of our food chain. And they are in the in the oceans today, they're one of the oldest living organisms that uh, we can record. And one of the neat things about this is that they live in the ocean. Other bigger organisms like krill or um, other bigger organisms than them eat them. And then as they are eaten, they then start, that organism starts pooping. And then the poop starts coming down and then say a fish comes by and eats that poop. Everything in the water, they keep eating each other. Then it finally starts going down to the bottom of the ocean. Now, presently at the bottom of the ocean, there's about two miles of poop that will is turning into rock as it slowly compresses. And so as you have this food chain building up, it records this story. Now, this rock through plate tectonics, where um, you've hopefully learned where um, land from the ocean can come on land because of, of uh, faulting, that these then tell a story. Now, um, and so what I looked at was this evolution, but we also can see how it evolved because of that upwelling, what was eating with it. And so that's how we can tell these stories just from a little bitty organism and that it was eaten and preserved from the bottom of the ocean. Now, these are pictures from Mission Peak because I'm now going to start talking a little bit more about our local area. Now, if you've ever gone to Mission Peak, and I know most of you have, or at least you know about it, you will see this rock to the right. If you notice, there's things kind of like this. And if you look at um, like a shell like this, what you're seeing is this side of the shell. So up on Mission Peak, there is marine fossils. Wait a minute, Are you? am I telling you that the ocean was that high up? No, not at all. That ocean was at, at sea level and plate tectonics, mainly the Hayward Fault, has brought that area up. And so as you walk up to Mission Peak, you'll see that there's layers of these fossils and they tell a story of violent rip up storms that killed layers and layers of shells and they're in layers and then you'll have normal sedimentation with very little fossils and then you'll see this layers as you're going up to mission peak and that tells a story a lot of times when you're walking around you see you'll see these big boulders those weren't put that by humans that that is because of plate tectonics and the movement now let's take a look at oh, why didn't that picture just come up Okay, there we go. This is what our area used to look like during the Pleistocene, um, which is the Ice Age, which is about 1.3 million years ago. So we had areas where we didn't have this big megafauna because we didn't have any dinosaurs here in the Bay Area because we were underwater. We used to have big whales that came in that we can find in the Calaveras. If you go over to the Sonol area, uh, and, and there's an area called the Calaveras Fault in that area, they found huge whales, big marine fauna. But as the water retreated because the plates started to bring the land up, 
all of a sudden the habitat changed. It went from a marine situation to freshwater. Now, when you have freshwater, that allows big mammals to come around. And so this is the fauna that we find in our area here. It's called the Irvingtonian because it was mainly found in the Irvington area of Fremont. And these were the animals that we seen. You see the big mammoths, which is in the middle there, the mastodonts, which are in the back. We had camels and horses and uh, the native horses and saber tooth cats, plus many, many other big mountain lion type organisms. We also had the giant sloth. We had lots of tulies and we had lots of cattails and we had lots of oak because these animals, especially like a, a Colombian mammoth, they eat about 800 pounds a day. Right now, Fremont doesn't have enough vegetation to support uh, a herd of them for even a week. Um, so these guys, it had to have been lush. We had to have rivers, but we had so many rivers there. That is what preserves that story. So let's kind of take a look now at this is some areas. And this is the story of the famous boy paleontologist who found these, who excavated these in the 1940s. Now, this is uh, this picture right here in, in the center. If you can see, and we'll see this again, um, you can see there's a difference in the sediment. There's like a yellow, and then where the people are kind of down low, that is actually the Hayward Fault. And that records this history. This area here in Fremont, because we had so many rivers and because we had such an um, abundance of life, we can record what has happened over the last 4,000 years. And believe me, it was a lot lusher than it is today. We had lots of rivers that came from um, more toward the mountains, um, from the Sierras that came via um, Alameda Creek. So imagine Alameda Creek bringing some of that vast water. So the water would go back and forth. The animals would be all over the place. But then what happened? Where did they go? Our last one, we think, is about 10 to 5,000 years ago, they went extinct. Um, was it humans? Well, for a long time, that was the theory, but humans, how can you, you can't really fight all these guys if there's only a, a tribe of, say, 100 individuals. These guys died because they lost their habitat. Big organisms. Now, how do we know that? Well, we have their fossil record. This is from... Um, this is uh, some bones of some ancient horses that lived in this area. And we start finding them and telling a story. Um, now, let's just take a look at the Grand Canyon, just so you understand that the Grand Canyon is an area that basically hasn't had a lot of tectonic motion. And so you see the layers very uniquely and can follow them up. We need areas like this to give us a better picture. In our area, because we are on a plate boundary, it gets all scrambled and meshed around. We've had subduction that makes the, um, the, the sediments that are forming to get all squished. So the record that we have here is complete, but it's like a detective. We have to figure out with the timing and what caused it and to tell our story over here. So if you look at the Grand Canyon, if you follow those beds, it goes all the way across. This is just, um, if you've never gone to the Grand Canyon and walked down there, this is seeing fossils at its best because it, it records fossils from um, uh, early Paleozoic all, all the way up to the Mesozoic. So this is just a cool way. You can walk down a mile down uh, basically carved by water, but it allows you to see this changes through time. Now, so that layer, just so make this clear, layer one is the oldest. And then as you go up to four, that's the youngest. And then we can start building a picture. Paleontology is meticulous. Um, it, you have to record it and it just takes a lot of time. It's not something real quick. Now, so 
we want to, our key concepts that we are looking at is how do organisms change as the land around it change? Well, there's these organisms. If you look at this um, uh, lizard here, notice what's happening. It's changing its color. How does it do that? How does evolution, um, uh, how do you evolve? How does an organism evolve? And, and why do they go extinct? Does the habitats, is, is that important? Well, these clues can be found in the present and also in the fossil. So there's a things that you'll be learning in especially biology called genotype and phenotype. Genotype is our genes that we're all made up of. And then the phenotype is the physical. So the so we're made, our DNA can change. Now, sometimes the chemicals in the area can cause uh, what we call spontaneous mutations. And that genotype can affect the phenotype. If it creates an organism that can survive in this, uh, an environment, then that will be the survival of the fittest. You've probably heard that before. So that this, this DNA, uh, the biological looking at it, can just change one of those little DNA things. But things that affect it could be diet, what you eat, the temperature, atmospheric gases, um, the, the humidity, that means the water, uh, even light can affect it. And more importantly is chemicals. Got to remember everything's made out of chemicals. Now, so let's look at some of these key things um, at a changing environment. So look at this moth here. This was the first one of the um, um, uh, key uh, observational facts that started that genotype phenotype evolutionary um, looking at organisms. During the industrial revolution in in uh, England, they noticed that the trees, because there was so much coal in the air, a lot of carbon, the trees were turning dark. And what happened was a moth, um, this is called the peppered moth. Um, if you look over to the left, that's in the early um, 1800s that look like that. Then all of a sudden they noticed that it was starting to change so it could hide within the darkened tree. So this started looking at this connection between humans impact in the environment and what's happened to the biological species. So there is changes. Why? Because of that genotype phenotype. And that is like our natural uh, selection. Now I want to um, show you this um, this little video of uh, Charles Marsh, and I because I want to talk about horses um, and how they've evolved on land. So let's look at um, among the the earliest scientific explorers was O. C. Marsh, Othniel Marsh of Yale University, got on the Union Pacific and stopped along the way. And one of the places he stopped was Antelope Station, Nebraska. And they had recently dug a, a well near the railroad. And uh, apparently the marsh had enough time at one of the train stops that uh, the diggers brought him a bunch of fossils, a bunch of teeth that they had, had dug up out of this well. And Marsh immediately recognized these things as the remains of uh, ancient horses, very small, what we would today call three-toed horses. He only had a few hours there, but he made a little collection, got back on the train, and eventually described these things as, uh, as new species. He realized that if he could just get a group of people and uh, get out and spend weeks or maybe even months out there that he probably could find a bonanza of fossil bones. And certainly in 1870, he uh, was able to do exactly that. He traveled with a horse, a horse and, and wagon train through the Nebraska sand hills and up to the Niobrara River and spent weeks and weeks collecting amazingly well-preserved fossils from along the Niobrara River. Marsh was able to show that uh, each little wrinkle in the teeth appeared and then eventually changed until finally 
Uh, you arrived at animals that could eat grass and it could run rapidly. And the, the idea being that as the climate changed, that the horses, as, as well as other animals, adapted to these changes. Being from Nebraska, I'm also grateful to Marsh in that he trained Nebraska's first and you could still argue a uh, best paleontologist, Erwin Barbour. So some of these early paleontologists started to lead the way. Now, the reason why I go through horses is we have a worksheet online about the evolution of horses. Horses are important to our fauna here because in the Bay Area, we have these three-toed horses from the pale, uh, Eocene all the way up to the, um, the, the horses that we find in the Irvington area. So we have um, another area, just like Nebraska, where we have these horses. Um, the reason why I, I'm a little interested in these horses right now is that we found a bunch of horses from um, a Facebook area where they made the new, in Menlo Park, they had to dig them and they found these uh, fossils here. They found, uh, and we have them here. We're gonna be, we're putting on a new display to show these fossils. Um, and we're trying to unravel what it means because for a long time they have felt that horses, the native horses went extinct and then were repopulated. Might change the story with some of these fossils. But if you look at them, it went from um, a three toed to a hoof. And so why did this happen? Well, we think it has to do with the evolution of grasses, evolution of teeth. And this is one of um, a mandible that we found. And you can look down in here, you can take it out in here and you can see these ridges. Um, what Marsh found was those ridges. And we have lots of teeth on display here from the Irvington tell a story in and of itself of how their teeth somehow adapted to the food. Because you got to remember, can you eat grass? You ever eat a grass that's kind of hard and chewy? And, and so these herbivores have to grind them down. And so if you look on our lab online, you will see this evolution and it asks you to kind of recreate what one of these um, horses might have looked like. Um, so this is another. Now, if you notice over here, um, the teeth are over to the right and those ridges start telling a story. So we're going to have a display just on the teeth here because horses are kind of cool. Now, also when the Spaniards came, they brought the European horse, which actually originated here probably in North America, went over to Asia, and then there's this whole movement of horses, and then it came back. Um, some people are starting to think that the Mustangs might still be of that original. Their genetics is telling a little story that's very, very intriguing. Um, so the migration of these horses tell a cool story, but it also tells of climate change. It, it starts going like, why and how did they adapt. Now, this is another one of um, the uh, North American uh, evolution. And right here, if you know where San Ramon is, um, up in the East Bay Hills there, there are other areas where you find lots of horse teeth. So this evolution was uh, pretty well documented. And it's cool. Now, so this is the activity. I'll let this play. For your activity, we have an art lesson for you. I am an extinct undulate or an animal with hooves. What you're going to do is look at that skeleton and try to recreate what it looked like. We give you clues by giving you the teeth, the legs, and somewhat of an idea of what they may have looked like. So then you need to draw what a horse looks like back then, what the horse that you think it might be. Now, horses are large animals, and you can look at their body shape, and this will give you some clues on how to draw what they might have looked like. 
So this just gives you, um, sometimes paleontologists have to be artists. You have to observe the body and figure out where they belong. I mean, you know, this isn't an ear, it isn't a nose. It has to be part of the leg bone because it's long and hard. Just look at your own body and try to figure out where things are. It's real important that present is key to the past. And so especially or before cameras came, we had to draw a lot of these a uh, animals um, and try to figure out what it meant. And this is observation over a lot of time. 